All right, taking off on that, I would submit that in terms of the personal legacy for you that, uh, that, that I was talking about, uh, the enactment of the private option, the most innovative health expansion state program in the country, whether it can, that, that would be your strongest legacy if it is continued. And I disagree. Okay, but can I ask my question? Sure. Uh, why do you disagree? Uh, <laughs> Well, I think there are two things that are transformational. Now, are you using that? <laughs> that that in I'm the long gonna... that in the long run, over over time, will actually exceed uh, the the private option. One is payment reform, which has not gotten the kind of national play or state play uh, that it deserves. But it, it the underlying way of the way we pay for health care in America is the old fee-for-service model. It is unsustainable. There's not enough tax dollars, there's not enough insurance premium dollars, there's not enough private money to continue that ad nauseum. And you couple that with the fact that our outcomes are not as, what, as, as good as many other Western civilized, industrialized countries in terms of health care. So you got a, a bad situation, you got higher costs, and worse outcomes. I mean, how, how do you, we did that once with workers' comp, and we fixed that, but how do, you, how do you get there, and then how do you fix it? I came away convinced uh, a number of years ago by some people, smart folks at Harvard and some other places that we're talking about, doing away with a fee-for-service model and substituting a different methodology on how you pay for health care. Arkansas has done that. We've done it slowly, we've done it incrementally, we've done it with various diagnoses, but ultimately, the other states are going to follow it. Ultimately, the national government's going to follow it. Ultimately, it is the way because it increases and rewards positive outcomes, and it rewards efficiency or punishes inefficiency. That, in my opinion, okay. is a transformational. Could you briefly tell the other one? Because I'm running out of time, and I got a lot of good questions. What's the other more transformational thing? I hope we've established a mindset in our people that we can do anything. As well the swagger, as the swagger. Yeah. You have said you want your legacy to be that Arkansas quits forever saying, thank God for Mississippi because we're a lot better than 49th and we need to have a swagger. A positive one, not a negative word. Texas one, but a good positive one. And I've written that's a whole bunch of swaggering Republicans here in Arkansas, uh, but that's okay. There's that's a, uh, Republicans okay. can swagger. Yeah. Let me ask you this. We've got to get four or five things before this hour's up. But on the, on the private option, I know you don't want to tell Asa Hutchinson how to do his job. But I want to ask you this. Can the governor-elect, Asa Hutchinson, cut middle class taxes by $100 million, not get reauthorization of the private option, which saves the state vital Medicaid money, build a prison and maintain it? which he's going to have to do, and do so responsibly without severe, painful impairment to state needs and services. Can he do that? I don't know how he can do it unless the revenue picture is so much better than what we project. Uh, because the, you know, we balance budgets, and we have to, and he's going to have to. And he's a smart guy. But I, uh, uh, let me be, let me say it this way. I always found it was better, and I think the people rewarded you for under-promising and over-delivering. You remember when I, I used that oh, yeah. phrase, and, and I believe it. Rather than promising people what you're going to do, tell them this is what you'd like to do, but you can't promise them until you find out all the facts and whether it's going to work and whether it's not going to work. And I think that you're going to make some people mad because you won't promise them what they want to hear. But in the long run, I think people reward you for that. I think you're honest with them, and I think you take a, a measured approach. I saw a new state rep uh, from Northwest Arkansas that that basically said that same thing the other day in one of the interviews. I honestly believe that when you make some promises, you've got that you that end up not being doable without severe pain. You've got one or two things you can do. You can keep the promise and inflict the severe pain that you might know is not the best public policy, or you need to go back to the people and say, I made a mistake. I messed up. I, I did something I shouldn't have done. 
I don't know whether it's, it's even possible to do that, but one thing you didn't mention was uh, Governor Hutchinson also told, this was widely reported in the press, also told the uh, higher ed folks last Friday he was not going to cut any higher ed. Well, 95% of all your money, all your state general revenue dollars goes to three places. It goes to education, it goes to prisons, and it goes to human services. So that only leaves 5% of the total budget for everything else. Can't cut K through 12 education constitutionally without running. Well, you five. can, or you'll get back in court. But yeah. you can. Yeah. Well, and, yeah, you're right. Which is a pop. And, and forget I said that. And and how do you cut Medicaid if you're already cutting out the private option under your uh, scenario? I mean, that creates huge. You can't throw folks out of nursing homes. I mean, and then prisons. You've already acknowledged that one of the things that, under your premise is to build another prison and maintain another prison. So where are you going to cut? And if you cut $100 million out of the budget, which I've already said they've got about a $25 million tax cut that goes into effect July 1st, I think they ought to defer until we see. I think that's, I told them when they did it, uh, we could afford $100 million in tax cuts in 13. I supported that. $150 million was too much, as luck would have it. We could have afforded under our forecast 125. So we only need to cut uh, 25. But uh, I mean, that, that's the scenario that we've got. And I, I don't see a real good way to do all those things under the premise that you just suggested unless revenue goes way up more than what we're forecasting. I'm just smiling about what a wonderful state Arkansas is. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to the governor about how we can't afford income tax cuts necessarily or it's difficult. And I look to the back and the legislature's leading tax cutter, Charlie Collins, Republican Fable, I'm grinning at me. So maybe y'all can talk about that later. Uh, actually, it was Charlie's tax cuts that I tax cut I embraced because uh, by passing the private option, and you got Sanders right there next, one of the architects in the legislature of the private option. One of the reasons that we could afford a hundred million dollars in tax cuts was because the private option freed up money that would otherwise have to go in certain places for uncompensated care and for Medicaid that allowed that $100 million tax cut that I supported. So it's appropriate those two guys are standing next to each other. All right, yeah. you should. <laughs> Representative uh, Collins and Senator Sanders in the back, uh, meet and greet them later. Okay, <coughs> time uh, being of the essence, let me pair from about 100 things to two things <laughs> that I see as potential Mars Mars, potential blemishes. Blemishes. Thank you. You're good with words. You should, you should become a columnist after. Uh, I don't want to go to the battlefield today after the battle and shoot the wound. That's what we do. I know. <laughs> you got that from me. Uh, I did indeed. Potential blemishes on your uh, legacy. Okay. I'll just tell a story. I'm talking to, some, to, to a room full of people in Fayetteville before the election. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who came out on the evening to see me, so most of them are liberal. And they're talking about, uh, we're talking about a lot of things, and I started talking about your governorship and, and the place in history. And this one fellow said, well, I'll tell you his place in history. One of these days, there's going to be hog waste in the Buffalo River. That's going to be his place in history. He was asleep at the switch. His whole administration let that happen. And I know you're going to say the process was followed, the federal government approved the loans, the permits were appropriate. Is, wasn't there something you and your administration could have done to rather to, to use your bully pulpit or whatever power the state has to have earlier sounded a public alarm and maybe headed that off? We might could have done that earlier. We might could have used the bully pulpit, and you're right. My, what I did was, I've used the bully pulpit and bullied folks into believing they can't do any more of those right now. I'm not sure I've got that. Yeah, because problem. you, I was going to say, you now have a moratorium, a moratorium yeah. of dubious yeah. right, but dubious, you got it. It's dubious legally. Uh, because, under the same theory that we had no power to stop it because it was a general permit once it was applied. Could I have raised the alarm earlier? Yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, and, and was someone asleep because we didn't? Answer is absolutely right. Yes, because I didn't know about it until it got to the Who's point. Who's supposed to tell you? It's my fault. It's my fault. Uh, if my people 
whether they're agency heads or agency personnel or my own staff, if I, if I don't know it, it's still my fault. So you are now saying? I wish it was never there. I've stopped all future ones. We have put all sorts of uh, stuff from the University of Arkansas to monitor, and at the first opportunity that it looks like there's any leachate into that Buffalo watershed, we will take the appropriate steps to stop it. Uh, we have followed the law. I don't really like the law. I think they ought to change the law so that CAFOs don't exist anywhere around a watershed going forward, and we're going to do the best we can to make a better situation out of a bad situation. If I had it to do over, it wouldn't happen. And if I had it to do over, there wouldn't be a coal-fired power plant down there at uh, Hope either. But it was two-thirds down the line when I came into office and couldn't stop it. Because natural gas is much cleaner, and we got a lot of it, and it dang sure could. I wish the plant was there. I wish it was natural gas. Wow. You would have you would have stopped the coal fire. You would have stopped Arkansas Electric Cooperatives from doing that building if you could have. I would have converted it to gas. Converted. So we made a little news. Yeah. Made a little it's news. really it's, not. It's, 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 it's not new news. I told the real press about it a long time ago. What's up? <laughs> Does anybody else want to do this? <laughs> I don't deserve this. You know. Calls you Michael Jordan. Uh, okay. The next thing I was going to ask you about would sound like retribution for what Go you ahead. just said. Go ahead. We've got two more things. Go One, ahead. let me just ask this. I feel a, 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 a journalistic obligation, even though I'm not a real journalist. Yeah. One thing you're doing as you leave office is granting a pardon to your son. Yes. And I've written, I don't have any problem with it, people in that circumstance, I fully sure. concur. Sure. You've said everybody get, else gets handled the same. Others in that situation get the same thing. Mm -hmm. Only if they ask, right? Only people yeah, who get, go through the pardon system. You've got to apply. Okay. Under the law, you have to does it, well, My question is, does it bother you, you at all that your, your son is getting something while appropriate that others don't know to ask for and are going to not get? Is, is, I mean, there's an, there's an inequality there, isn't there? No. And he, here's, here's my answer to that. I've had a, a pretty consistent philosophy about all this since I've been in office. I'm extraordinarily strict and conservative on commutations. That is, shortening somebody's sentence or letting them out of prison early. I've granted eight in eight years. Uh, and that's because the circumstances uh, were such that it was manifestly easy to see that injustice occurred. Or in some cases, humanitarian help was appropriate. So I'm real strict on cutting people's sentences. I'm very liberal on pardons, particularly pardons for nonviolent crime, particularly young people that, that, that did the drug stuff and finish their sentence, finish their probation, finish their fines, whatever they got. And some period of time has elapsed so that uh, you're never guaranteed, but you've got some idea that they learned something and they've, they've straightened up. Now, I'm, I don't normally do, I've done a couple, but I don't normally do the violent crime pardons, the, uh, even when they're out. But uh, I believe in second chances for young people. I've granted something like 750 pardons in those eight years along those same lines. Now, it would have been easier for me, and you can talk about legacy if you want to, the easiest thing for me to do would have been not fade this heat, not do it. Don't grant my son a pardon, even though I've granted all these other folks similarly situated a pardon. He had over two ounces, or two ounces or something like that, of marijuana in 2003. He had three years probation and a fine. That was all finished in 2006. This is now 2014. Is he capable of messing up? Absolutely, just like most of them are. But he hadn't had any other criminal uh, convictions of any kind since that time. 
and to my knowledge, he hadn't been involved in any activity since that time, but I can't even, I don't even know that. Now, I've, I'm faced with two things. Treat him different, to keep criticism away from me, to keep people from saying, you're just using your power to help your own family. Or treat him like I've treated the others and don't punish him for being my son. He's already been punished for being my son. When it happened to him, it was all over the front pages, the blogs, people that don't like me wrote all kinds of nasty things about him. And if he hadn't been my son, it never would have been a thing mentioned. He's scattered all over the news now, and just by your question, will be some more because he's my son. Whereas there's 700 others like him that you don't even know about, and they can walk down the street and nobody's going to say anything to him. He won't be treated worse by me. If I'm going to treat him, if I'm going to treat him anyway, he's my son, I'm going to treat him better. But I'm not treating him any better, but I'm dang sure not going to treat him worse just so people won't criticize me or just so people won't say his legacy is tarnished. Uh, he deserves the same thing everybody else. All right. Uh, one other thing I'm just dying to ask you. <laughs> While you've been governor, a great social movement sprang up all around you, except, uh, quite apart from your governorship, and took great speed, and has taken great speed today, and had a little 5248 setback in Fayetteville yesterday. Yeah. But tomorrow, the Arkansas Supreme Court, maybe, I think, we're going to have to do it about tomorrow, yeah. I think, going to have to rule on Judge Piazza's, the appeal of Judge Piazza's ruling. You've described yourself to me as a fiscal conservative and social moderate. But on this issue, unless I'm mistaken, your most recent operative comment was to the Stonewall Democrats, gay and lesbian group, in 2011 or 12. Mm -hmm. And you went to them very nobly and bravely and said, I'm not either for same-sex marriage, I'm not even for uh, civil unions. I'm just not. Well, I've what's, that, what's that all about? I've Are, modified you, a little bit on, on some of that aspect in, in, in terms of discrimination on employment, discrimination on the ability of people to, uh, to have insurance. To the extent that civil unions uh, encompass that, I've, I've moved in that direction. I still believe, and maybe it's just the way I was brought up, I still believe marriage is between a man and a woman. You think you're going to be on the wrong side of history on that? You know, I can't worry about that. I have to do what I believe in. Uh, I may well be on the wrong side of history on that and on a lot of things. But you don't govern by worrying about where the... Well, let's be serious. There's no political popularity in Arkansas in supporting same-sex marriage. No, uh, but there is, there is, as you point out, political popularity in being uh, at the head of something that you suggest would put someone on the wrong side of history, 10, 12, you 15, have a, 20 years. You have evolved on that issue. The president himself uh, has talked about evolving. You, got, you, you encountered great animosity from the uh, gay and lesbian community in 2006. You were even then against the right of adoption, foster care. I changed on that. You changed. Quickly. I'm giving you a chance to change now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I wrote, I wrote, one of these, I know Mike B.B. I put this in a column. One of these days, he's going to lean down on that steering wheel and that golf cart up at Cersei, and he's going to pop a beer, and he's going to say to whoever he's playing with, you know, there's no reason that people, that, that gays can't marry. I guess I was wrong. I mean, you, you really are not, why not? I suppose it's just the tradition of where I come from and uh, the way I was raised and what I, uh, what I think that uh, marriage ought to be between a man and a woman. Okay. All right. We got run out of time. Let's, let's, t let's turn our attention then to that golf cart in Cersei and your retirement. 
I worry about you. <laughs> Ginger said, me too. <laughs> you have been on this stage, metaphorically, for three, 30 years plus. You, you've been not only involved in state government, but running a great deal of it. You have, it has been your essence. When a person loses their essence, it's worrisome to me. When I, if you told me I couldn't write a column today and make everybody mad in the morning, I would, I would, I would, I would not know what to do with myself. <laughs> I know you love to play golf, and there are more eagles to be made, and I know you've got wonderful grandchildren, but I think you may well go mad. Uh, uh, <laughs> sitting up in Searcy watching this legislature and not being able to affect anything. What are you going to do? How are you going to cope? I haven't announced this until this minute. But I sent my resume to Hussman about doing a column. <laughs> He was saying the other day he needs a right wing balance for me, and I, I, I think you, I you got it. it. You got I it. it. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I don't have any immediate plans to do anything. Uh, I am open to some things. You are right. Uh, as Ginger said, I don't sit well, and there are just so many rounds of golf you can play and so many books you can read, and I think she said something the other day about so many crossword puzzles you can work. Uh, and she doesn't want me hanging around on your foot, and there's no question about that. Uh, I, I've, I've conjured in my mind some options, none of which are full-time. I've, uh, I've said I may serve on a board or two. I said uh, I may teach a college course. Uh, I, uh, I may consult, not as a lobbyist, because I don't want to do any of that stuff, but I mean, I may talk to folks about economic development, whether they're uh, local economic development officers in Fayetteville or Jonesboro or Little Rock. Uh, but I'm not going to do anything full time, or at least I don't plan on doing anything full time. And I'm going to let it evolve. I'm going to take it easy and, and see what happens. And, and uh, if I get too bored, we'll go figure out something. We'll go tear something up and try to fix it. You're not, you're, you're not doing any lawyering? No, I don't plan to practice. You'll anything. not do any lobbying? No, I'm not going You'll to do You'll do some quote, consulting. Well, I'm not even sure that's a good term, because uh, I don't, if it even approaches the idea of lobbying, I don't want to do it. I, like you said, I'm too used to being asked. I don't want to do the asking. <laughs> it's a slow ripple of laughter on that, <laughs> because they knew that was the truth. Okay, there's I'm not the only one here. They can strut sitting down. You know, it's, I don't think, if I had this to do over again, I don't think I'd do it. Uh, <laughs> all right, let me get all soapy, no, okay? No, don't, don't, please don't. Let me get all soapy. Don't. I mean, because he acts like his feelings are hurt. I know they're not. The most acute political columnist and writer in my professional career, the guy that got the most information, understood it the best, and communicated it the best is John Brown. <laughs> My further analysis about Brummett is that he's 85% lab and 15% pit bull <laughs> when it comes to me. That is, 85% of the time he says nice things about me, and just to show the world that you can't take anybody for granted and that he is not really enamored with anybody, he bites my head off. <laughs> I expect that will continue, but he'll have less opportunity to do it after next year. A couple of questions that just occurred to me. <laughs> and then we'll quit. Are we out of time? We got five? I, I just, this, this is, this is mildly inappropriate. But the New York Times did it. <laughs> well, that makes it all right. The New York Times came here to do a piece about Arkansas, and the reporter just, 
she just took a shine to you. <laughs> Do y'all remember the line in this piece? She quoted an unidentified woman as saying, he speaks like molasses and I want to have his children. <laughs> and I just want to know, what is it like to have something like that said about you in the New York Times? What is it like? Uh, Good? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I first heard about that because we were riding back from a, a speech or an event downtown, and I think it was Grant to Neil that was, might have been Matt, one of them had their iPad out and, and the article had just come out online and said, Ginger's not going to like this. <laughs> Finally, we've got a, a typical Arkansas story. we have got a Democratic governor with high 60s, maybe sometimes 70% approval rating. It's mostly 70. Yeah. <laughs> Most popular in the country. And yet the Democratic Party <laughs> collapses around him. Uh, and you talk about cyclical things. Do you feel any obligation to consider running for something again? There's no. a U.S. Senate race coming up in 2016. Are you absolutely, positively, unequivocally through with ever seeking elective office in this state? That is. You are, your statement is what my plan is. Why is that? I'm, 60, I'm about to be 68. And while that's young in today's world, it's still time to smell the coffee. Uh, I encourage good people to run, and I don't want to be too much of a hypocrite uh, when I refuse to do it, even though I want other good people or what I think are good folks to run. Uh, I, I would argue I've served my time. Uh, I've, uh, I've said I'll never be able to repay the state back for what it's done for me, but I've come about as far as I know how to go doing that. And uh, so, and gosh. That place up there is so much different. We've got folks in the audience that worked up there in times past. Uh, it's not a collegial atmosphere up there anymore. Uh, and, uh, and that's a coward's way out to say that I don't want to get in the middle of all that stuff. I hope some good folks do go up there, but uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to go smell the, the coffee. Is there anything you can do in your retirement to help rebuild this party? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Facts rebuild parties and, and, and work rebuilds parties. And people working together rebuild parties and what they stand for. I mean, uh, the, the Democratic Party uh, and, and the opportunities afforded by policies of the Democratic Party is the reason I'm sitting here. Uh, college loan, when we didn't have any money, didn't even have to pay it back until I got out of school. Didn't even start the interest until I got out of school. Uh, the opportunity to be able to, uh, uh, to go to a school and have... Uh, have the education that I got and do the things that I've been able to do, the, the chance for uh, other folks similarly situated to have those opportunities now going forward. I mean, uh, the party that I, that I belong to created the chances for me to even be here. Uh, of course, I will do all I can to, to try to help it. Now, having said that, I'm a firm believer in working across party lines, and we've seen examples of it uh, in our legislature. And uh, the... the the opportunity to work, that, that, that Republican business uh, pragmatic, pragmatic uh, segment of uh, the legislature uh, worked with me and I worked with them, and except for social issues, which they unconstitutionally went crazy over, uh, <laughs> we agreed most of the time. And even when they were doing that, I knew a lot of them knew better, uh, but for whatever reason, probably for other reasons, uh, they did what they did. Courts have subsequently borne out that they shouldn't have done it, but uh, we'll see. All right. One more chance uh, on the uh, gay issue. Okay. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we I don't know. We had evolution. We'll, we'll see. One of these days. We're going to get in the wrap-up sign. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, the governor, and they say, uh, but you don't care about that, It's going to go back here, and it's you know, like a preacher receiving the congregation after he will be out here, and you can say hello to him. Uh, we are done. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you. Oh.